Welcome to the Faith and Reason podcast on Paving the Way Home. Uh, we're back with the Faith and, well, what do we call it? The Church and Science series, is it, Father Connor? Sounds right. And we have Father Connor today. So, um, so today, Father Connor is going to speak to us about the the period leading up leading up to the universities, kind of the kind of the five hundred to a thousand AD, um, and just education at that time, pretty much. Father Connor, is that right? That's right, exactly. And it's a period that very few people know much about, um, and people often presume that nothing was happening at all during that time. And so hopefully we'll fill in the gaps a little bit and we'll see once again how faith and reason work together in this period in institutions, in individuals and so on. That's great, because I think there there can be like I know nothing about that period, so I'm looking forward to learning. But it's I think there can be a bit of a kind of um, an arrogance uh, that we can kind of think that maybe 20, 21st century is where all the intelligence is. And prior to that, you know, it's. Yeah, people are just twiddling their thumbs. Yeah, and I think really Isaac Newton had the right idea. He described himself um, as you know seeing further than others than previous generations because he was standing on the shoulders of giants. And that was Isaac Newton himself who did so much to revolutionize um, science, especially physics. And so I think we we should have the same uh, humble attitude as well that these previous generations they're full of giants. You know, they didn't have access to the same technology that we do, to the same range of information that we do. And yet, you know, in their time, um, they did what they could to advance the frontiers of knowledge um, and to teach above all. Yeah, because I, I think the that, ser- that episode we did on Albert de Great, I think that just that blew me away. Kind of, I suppose, again, like that, it's it's just arrogance. But um, you know, it's it's seeing. I know, okay, we've we've Thomas Aquinas, and and, but aside from him, you know, it's it's great to come across some some other just just knowing that there were geniuses around that time, and there was just and not just that that there was great education going on for everyone else, and we're only products of that as well. Exactly. And I think when we saw with Albert as well, um, we're going kind of way back before Albert this time, but with Albert, we saw that all of his scientific work, all of the science that he did, um, it was all done in the context of, you know, right at the heart of the church, um, where he was totally part of the mainstream and well received and praised because also of his scientific work, which just shows again how untrue it is um, that the church was kind of suppressing science. And we'll see the same in, in this period that the figures we're looking at and so on. It's all at the heart of the church that this uh, uh, scientific teaching is being is being handed on. So, like, if we just jump a little earlier than the, the 500 to the 1000 that we're focusing on, just to give a, a general overview. So I know in um, in the Jewish schools and things like that, you know, that they were there was great learning and stuff like that for for Jewish children there was great education there for them and and stuff and they were learning the scriptures and they were learning you know the the different things that they were learning um obviously we know that there was the Greeks had their great academies as well and and things like that prior to all that but during kind of um no I know that the Jewish thing was during Roman occupation but in the Roman side of things what was education like in just in kind of Roman lands as well. So. Yeah, well, I mean, by the time they, they conquered Greece, they, you know, borrowed an awful lot of Greek culture. So as the old saying goes, that conquered Greece, conquered Rome um, by, by means of its culture. Um, and so uh, in, in the Roman world, in the Roman Empire, um, uh, education meant education in the Greek tradition, especially. Now, of course, Romans had their own uh, their own traditions, their own customs, and a major emphasis on law there. Um, but for, for philosophy, for the sciences and so on, they were constantly relying on what the previous centuries of, of Greek thinkers had done, especially people like Aristotle um, in the fourth uh, century BC. Um, and, and in medicine, you know, figures even before him, like Hippocrates and that whole school. Um, but in the in the Roman world, um, let's say in late antiquity, so towards the end of the Roman Empire, you have a, a sort of a curriculum forming um, and a curriculum that that is becoming broadly accepted as you know 
This is what an education consists in. Um, and it consisted in seven uh, different subjects. Um, three focusing on language and then four focusing on more mathematical or scientific subjects. Um, so the three focusing on language um, were uh, grammar, just the basic structure of the language itself, rhetoric then, how to, how to convince people, how to give speeches that won people over, which included you know, the use of emotion and so on. And then logic, just how to make true arguments. So a true argument, you know, an argument that's valid might not actually be the most appealing. That's why you need rhetoric uh, to, to build your case. And then finally, the, the four scientific subjects, the quadrivium, first three are the trivium and the quadrivium. Um, and that's arithmetic, astronomy, geometry, and uh, music. But music really as a form of, of mathematics. And really in, in the, the Roman period, in, in, in the pagan Roman world, Education certainly was very valued, and very often there were public schools, um, uh, so it wasn't only for um, for the elite, but generally people um, needed some support if they were going to be educated further. So the case of St. Augustine is a good example. Um, he was educated by a grammarian first in his hometown, and his family were kind of middle class. But then in order to go further, in order to go to Carthage and become a, a teacher of rhetoric, he needed the support of a philanthropist, a local philanthropist. And um, so that's how that works. So there were definitely um, limits to how far people could go uh, if they didn't have if they didn't have the means. But there were certainly schools there. There were certainly teachers um, and uh, and education was highly valued. OK, now that, that that's great. So I suppose Greece. So it, it's we can thank the Roman Empire in a way for for bringing some of that um, that that great thinking and, and some of that back into Central Europe. Exactly. And it, it, it's a funny thing. You know, we often think of sort of conquest and, and so on as just being destructive. And it is. And of course, for the people at the time, when the Roman army invades kind of Greece and, and, and destroys cities like Corinth and so on. And, um, you know, it's a hor horrific suffering for the people at the time. And yet these kind of conquests, they often bring about a cultural sort of mixing that can often be very enriching. So you'll see it later with um, you know, um, with the the, um, the Mongols and so on, uh, they because they just cut through, cut across borders and cut through different empires, and they take the best of learning from 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 different parts. And um, so you have you know Chinese technology and you know architects maybe from the West, and they'll all be learning from each other at the court of the Khan. And the same thing was kind of happening in in the Roman Empire that um, because they were just um, such an expansionist empire, uh, they were also drawing together many different cultures and the best of those cultures, um, which led to a kind of a cultural and intellectual flourishing. That's that's amazing because I think when we look at universities today, we kind of, we celebrate the multiculturalism and things like that as if it's something we've invented ourselves. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, of course, they weren't always, I mean, Rome probably had a sense of its superiority and it was, you know, uh, their empire was maintained by, by force and so on. And we'll see it later in the, in the Middle Ages um, when uh, Christian armies reconquer parts of Spain, and um, of course it'll you know be very bloody and so on, and yet there are libraries that that remain now that are now in the Christian lands, libraries full of Arabic texts that are really really important for what will happen later in the universities. But we're we're getting ahead of ourselves there. But yeah, so that a, a funny mix of you know violence and then uh, cultural flourishing that can go together sometimes surprisingly. And what year did the Roman Empire fall? So usually they say that, you know, I think 476 is, is, a, is a date that, that's often given for it. Um, but it had been weakened um, by, you know, huge onslaughts. Um, these Germanic tribes constantly um, attacking from the east. And um, so if you've seen the start of Gladiator, um, you'll have seen uh, those Germanic tribes and the Roman armies trying to keep them at bay. Um, uh, so that was that was constantly happening. The Roman Empire was being was being weakened by these invasions of Germanic tribes. Now, in some cases, these Germanic tribes became Romanized um, and and were sometimes, you know, even um, became senators and so on. So it was over over a few hundred years that this was happening, um, a process of invasion and also assimilation, um, but a general weakening of the institutions. Because if you're constantly dealing with invaders, you're not going to be able. Um, to be giving lots of money to to support the arts, to support learning. You know, if you have to, you know, at a time of of um, uh, when of defensiveness, um, you're going to be investing hugely in military spending. 
and very little in educational spending. And that's, that's what was happening towards the end of the Roman Empire. There was a certain kind of decline at that stage. And I suppose that, you know, when we look even, when we look close to home, when we look at Ireland, when, when your country has been, as we say, like liberated from a ruler or an oppressor or whatever language someone wants to use, and you look at this happening in different countries at different eras, you know, it's countries fall into poverty straight away and, and things like that. So after the Roman Empire fell, then like, were there really kind of dark ages to follow? Yeah, and that's it's usually what people mean by the Dark Ages. They mean when the Roman Empire fell um, and, and in those centuries that followed, maybe, you know, five, six, seven hundred years, they often speak of them as the Dark Ages. Um, and it can be really exaggerated. Hopefully we'll, we'll see by the end of this that, that it is often exaggerated that, in fact, um, there was a great deal of, of cultural activity and, and educational activity and scientific activity and being carried on during those years. But it is true to say that something was lost. So above all, contact, kind of a living contact with Greek learning was lost. Um, and many, many of the texts I mentioned in these uh, in Roman schools, um, that it was often expected that the Romans would, young Romans would learn Greek in order to study these texts. So they weren't often, they weren't always translated into Latin. And so when, you know, when the, the Western Roman Empire is falling apart, um, and people are no longer learning Greek, they're losing contact with this huge heritage of learning. Um, and so for several hundred years, a great deal of important texts, a great number of important texts are lost and a kind of a habit of thinking as well um, is, is weakened. Um, so for example, Aristotle, this hugely important Greek thinker who wrote on everything from you know, politics to metaphysics to biology, reproduction, sleep, everything. Um, the vast majority of his works are lost, except for you know, a handful, like his works on logic. So throughout this period, people will be reading Aristotle on logic, but they won't be reading all the other works um, that are continuing to be read uh, in, in the East. Um, so there's definitely, there's, there's a, a, certain, a certain decline, um, but as we'll see, huge numbers of people still did their very, very best with the limited resources that they had. You see, I, I find this fascinating now because, you know, we, we've got, you've got the, the pre-Socratic philosophers and then you've got, you know, you've got Socrates, you've got Aristotle, you've got Plato. You've, then you move forward, like these are the great thinkers, you move forward then and, and then we've got some of the, the great Jewish minds and then, then Jesus comes and, you know, then we've got the Greek schools and, and you know, obviously we've got the, the text, the the New Testament written in Greek and things like that. But there there can be this thing sometimes looking back as if like, oh, well, the people believed in Jesus because, um, oh, they were simple minded back then. There was no, you know, and it's like we can all think now we're educated, so we don't need that religious mumbo jumbo type of thing. So it's great to actually get a a picture of, um, I suppose, where where we're all coming from, because this is all stuff that's been passed on. It does it does include us. Yeah, absolutely. And in the in in the early Christian world, definitely there were people who were very well educated in in this whole Greek culture. And um, so Saint Paul, you know, when he's speaking to the um, to the Athenians, to the philosophers in the Areopagus, he's able just to like name drop, and he just like drops the name of a poet, quotes quotes this Greek poet quotes a Greek philosopher, I think a Stoic philosopher. And so he, he knows his stuff. He's able to, to speak their language as well. As he said, he's a Jew with Jews. He's a Greek with Greeks. Um, but definitely there were also people, you know, of high social status um, in the very early church. It wasn't just a church of slaves. It was a whole mix of people. And so there would have been people there in the early church who were absolutely committed to Jesus and who, who were very, very well educated um, in, the, in the culture at the time. So... With the loss of, you know, a lot of this, this of during the, the fall of, of the Roman Empire, how do Christians respond to the loss of learning and, and things? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see um, how, let's say, people like St. Augustine and others after him, who were definitely aware of a kind of a decline. They were definitely aware that, I mean, in the year 410, Rome falls. And for that's a huge trauma. St. Jerome, I think he's in Bethlehem when he hears that this happens. And he just, the letters he writes about the fall of Rome, it's just, it's unimaginable to him. His world is falling apart. 
Um, and St. Augustine too, it's a trauma for, for him and for his friends. And it's the reason St. Augustine writes this massive work, The City of God, where he kind of reminds um, Christians that their, their citizenship, their allegiance is not to any earthly regime, but to, to heaven and earthly regimes will come and go. But as well, St. Augustine, as well as being aware of this kind of decline, He's preparing for the future. And so at a very early stage in his um, uh, in his Christian life, um, he decides that he wants to, to write a series of works that are going to be like um, textbooks for the Christian classroom. And he's borrowing now from the seven liberal arts. So he's just going to take the, the seven liberal arts of the, of the Roman classroom and just kind of Christianize them, if you like. And he only gets around to writing uh, two of these seven, I think. Um, and interestingly, the earliest fragment of his his work on music, the earliest fragment of it is written in an Irish hand. And um, so it's a sign, an early reception in Ireland. I think it's a seventh century manuscript, an early reception of Augustine's writing on music um, in Ireland. But in any case, Augustine is, you know, thinking of how can I, how can I develop a curriculum? Um, the best of, you know, linguistic and scientific knowledge from the ancient world that will be part of the Christian world that I'm helping to build. And slightly later than him, you have two key characters, um, Isidore and Cassiodorus. And Isidore is in Spain. And actually, his boss is, is one of these Gothic Germanic uh, invaders who has now become kind of a king, a Romanized sort of king. And he patronizes Isidore, this Christian bishop. And Isidore, among other things, he writes a huge encyclopedia, a 20-volume work called The Etymologies. And in it, he just writes about everything under the sun, the seven liberal arts and, you know, geography and political terminology and so on. Um, and he's explaining, you know, everything that, that he knows <laughs> um, uh, so that in future Christian libraries will have this, this great resource. And again, monasteries and cathedrals, they will continue reading and copying Isidore for, for centuries. Um, and then finally, you have Cassiodorus, Cassiodorus is a really fascinating figure. Um, so he's there kind of towards the end of the Roman Empire in, uh, in Rome, and he's applying for, um, effectively applying for funding um, for, to found a school in Rome. And he's aware of, um, you know, the problems uh, that, you know, the, there's constant invasions and so on. And so the, em the emperor says to him, look, at, it's just, it's not going to happen. We don't have the money for this because of what we're spending on the military. So he has to retreat. And he goes down south to a place called Vivarium. And there he sets up a community of scholars. So these are Christian scholars who are, who are also praying. So it's not really, they're not quite monks. It's a community of scholars who also pray, whereas monks are like a community of prayers who also sometimes study. But in this place, Vivarium, they copy texts um, and they, they study and they think and they, they teach each other and they teach people who join them and so on. And so... Again, there's a very deliberate um, uh, sort of practice of preserving and passing on, transmitting the best, not only of divine knowledge. Of course, there are, all of these people are studying the scriptures intensely, but also the best of human learning as well um, is being passed on by Christians very deliberately at this time. And were these, were these mainly religious? Was it all religious or were there some lay people or, or what, what was the, the mix in these communities? Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. When, when Augustine sets up his first kind of community of um, sort of uh, scholars um, and, and people seeking God, but also reading great literature and so on, there initially it's the lay community. Um, so certainly they were, they were open to, to the possibility of, of communities of, of lay people um, dedicated to the purpose of learning. And Cassiodorus, I'm not 100% sure how many would have been ordained, how many would have you know, taken vows and so on. Um, or would it more would it have been more like a, a lay community? Um, I'm just not not too sure about that. And you know, I suppose when you hear of communities like that, and and then there's religious worship and stuff like that. Obviously, someone it's it's the age of the internet. Someone is going to hear that and say cult. You know, it's they're going to say this is a big cult. It's brainwashing. It's whatever. As if faith and reason have no kind of. Uh, do you know that there, there's no kind of relationship between the two. So how how would you respond to that to, to these minds that are that are in these kind of um, in these communities? Yeah, that's that's such an interesting 
connection to make. And that when we think of a, a community of people dedicated to a purpose, we think it's probably something cultish. And I think it's it's more a problem in our age. I mean, of course, cults are always a always a risk, but maybe our age, we we value the idea of kind of somebody who who's doing everything on his own and kind of this solitary genius. You know, we think somebody like Isaac Newton, away on his own, away from everybody, during a plague, you know, uh, thinking about gravity. You know, that's our kind of ideal of the intellectual. Whereas if you, if you think about it, it's not really how things work. Um, we're so much more communitarian than that. Um, and the fact that we value universities and the fact that we value the idea of kind of collegiality in universities, people who study together, who share their ideas, who aren't greedy with their ideas and so on, but will share them. I think that all speaks to the fact that really learning and teaching and seeking for truth is, is something that's inherently communitarian when humans do it. Um, and so I, I, I don't see any, any uh, issue really there in, in founding communities uh, focused on, on, on learning. I think it's more our problem that we're suspicious of, of communities. I think that's maybe a symptom of late capitalism or something like that. Yeah, I think that's interesting because also like at this time we had monasteries and we don't look at monasteries as being a cult. And I don't know, is it because of the because of the stone walls? You know, that like, you know, that whereas it's more I'm thinking these open communities and that's just, you know, I suppose I'm always thinking defensively and kind of someone's going to say that, you know, kind of thing. But but when I just touched on monasteries there, where do monasteries fit in at this time? So, you know, we're, as we're calling them, the Dark Ages, but as you mentioned there, you know, Augustine, the city of God is, is about, I suppose, like that holding to one true thing while there's chaos and, and things falling down around you. Monasteries are are that place, I suppose, where, you know, they're, they're, they're timeless in a way and and it kind of the things can be going to chaos around you but you know the monastery at least has that fixed focus on on god so so where where is the monastery fitting in at this time yeah well i mean at the same time as cassiodorus is is founding his community saint benedict is is founding um his monastery um in in monte cassino um and so i think really you can just see them as parallel um, and just slightly different emphases, um, because even though we think of monasteries as you know, primarily places of prayer, which which they are, um, in all the early rules, there'll also be an emphasis on on learning and on study. So, for example, in a rule that's called the Rule of the Master that influenced um, Saint Benedict, um, I'll just read out a little bit from it, so you get a sense that these guys are emphasizing learning as part of the monastic life. So during winter, since the brothers cannot work in the morning. From 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., the monks separate into groups of 10 and go each to their appointed place. In each place, one of the 10 will read and the others in the group will listen. During these three hours, the children, because they're also kind of very young members of the monastery, and the children in groups of 10 will learn their letters on wax tablets. That's how you learned to write back then because you didn't have paper, so you wrote, you wrote on wax. And will learn their letters on wax tablets under the guidance of a literate monk. As for illiterate adults up to the age of 50, we will also teach them to read and write. At the end of these three hours of spiritual work, we will put back the wax tablets and books and we'll go to the oratory for the divine praises at 9 a.m. So these three hours in the winter, in groups of 10, people are learning, 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 thinking, reading, being open to new ideas. And of course, the main thing they're studying, of course, is, is the scriptures. Um, but under the influence of uh, people like Cassiodorus, monasteries will also begin to teach the full range of the liberal arts. St. Benedict himself emphasizes this, and um, he includes study as part of his rule as well. And even, you know, in Irish monasteries, people like St. Columbanus, you know, St. Columbanus is famous for being incredibly strict, incredibly ascetical, and he just wants his monks to just like, you know, fall into bed in the evening because they're just so exhausted with work. But nevertheless, he makes time for study. And he himself, was a great student. He was attracted to the monastery of Bangor um, partly by the learning that was done in that place. So you see in the monastic movement, in the early monastic movement, prayer and study, they just go together. And um, all of these monasteries, where, where a monastery is famous for its learning, it will always also be famous um, for the devotion um, of, the, of the monks. They, 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 they go together in the literature at the time. 
Um, so there's no sense in which these things are held in tension as if a monastery where people are thinking is a bad monastery or a suspect monastery, anything but. They, they, they go together from the earliest period. That's, that's great because I'm just thinking, when you think of today, I suppose, our attention spans are very short, you know. It's, um, okay, with, with this interview, if someone's watching it on, on YouTube, if they're watching the video kind of uh, version of this, I speak, you speak, we're not flashing camera angles. But um, I remember seeing a thing before that um, apparently that doesn't work very well anymore. That uh, apparently um, when you're watching something on TV, three seconds is all that any frame should have. Um, and, and we're constantly getting flashed at uh, pictures changing. I never realized it un until I saw it, but it's because we don't have attention spans that kind of last very well anymore. Um, and, you know, we're at this... We're at this culture where it's always on our phones, maybe go to Netflix, go to whatever, stay up late, achieve nothing, like but stay up late, you know, be kind of zombies all the time. But like, there's a lot to be said then for the day where you actually maybe go out in the garden, actually do some, you know, that, that good day you spend, like in the summertime, you get a lot done, you go to bed exhausted and, you know, but you've, you've achieved something. You know, and, and maybe, you know, or, or like that when, when you learn something and you're you're tired from studying, but not just studying so you can memorize something for an exam, but you, you've actually maybe picked up a book that you've been interested in, you're reading it and you're taken by it and, you know, your knowledge is expanding. It's great. Like there, there's something great in that achievement. And I think that, you know, fr from that, when I hear of those times like that, that they're getting up, they're achieving all of these different things and maybe falling into bed tired um, and fitting in their their prayer, because so often, you know, I'll hold my hands up so often I'll achieve nothing during the day and I'll still have found that I didn't find time for prayer, you know, and it's like my prayer going to bed is like, Jesus, I'm, I'm too tired, you know, I'll, I'll pray tomorrow. And it's, you know, it's, like that, it, it's, um, I just think that it's it's amazing how much they did live. And for all the thing of, we think that we're so advanced now, we, we've kind of, we've got so many distractions that maybe they are a hindrance to us fully achieving our, our full potential, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I suppose monks, monks are privileged in the sense that they're often, you know, supported by wealthy patrons and, um, uh, it certainly wasn't, you know, it wasn't easy in that time to find the leisure, you know, an awful, the vast majority of people living in during that time would have just been, you know, working their backsides off as, as peasants and just barely surviving. Um, so the monastery is a kind of a privileged place. Um, but you can see how the way of life in a monastery, um, that it, it, it would support the intellectual life more than our way of life now. So just the kind of the regularity of it. And the, the systematic nature of the education, everybody has a kind of a, a common basis. They've all studied the same text. And so you can have shared conversations very easily. Um, and then the fact that classrooms were just part of, of the monastery and um, because you're you have to train new recruits all the time. And the fact that monasteries, you know, they just see things in a very broad frame of reference over a long period of time. If you, I mean, I'm not a monk, I'm a friar, but when I chat to monks, they just see things differently. And they see things, you know, with a much longer time frame, whereas I'm always thinking, you know, what are we going to do in the next six months? And they're thinking, you know, what's our plan for the next 40 years? Um, so it's a very, very different approach to things. Um, and I think all of those things um, work towards, you know, supporting um, uh, the, the, the intellectual life and supporting um, inquiry and study and deep, deep reflection. And obviously we're, we're talking about this great Christian culture, but... The rulers weren't all Christian in, in all the, the different countries at, at different times. So what about the, the secular rulers? Um, did they support all this education, you know, and, and the kind of the, the monasteries and, and things like that? Because I suppose these things are, I can see how they could be a threat to um, some secular rulers who may not want someone, you know, first of all, getting educated, being taught against the idea of a secularist ruler kind of, you know, as, um, so I suppose what, what was the, what was the feeling out there? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think generally um, sort of the better rulers and the, the wiser rulers certainly saw the value of 
of education and the value of monasteries um, for that purpose and cathedral schools because cathedral cathedrals also often had schools um, where um, uh, this kind of education was happening as well. Um, and there are some brilliant examples of rulers, some of whom were pretty savage on the battlefield, but who were also great promoters of education. And really the best example of that is Charlemagne, who's crowned um, on in Christmas Day on the year 800. Um, and he uh, and his successors and kind of the, the various kingdoms, they, they um, divide up between themselves. They become huge patrons um, of education. And they, 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 lay, they write letters to, to their abbots, to their bishops, um, and they say, you've got to set up schools if you don't have any schools. You've got to make sure these schools are running properly. We look after the funding of them. Um, and so they, they, they establish schools in, in their palaces as well. There are palace schools um, in places like um, Pavia and, and, and elsewhere. Um, and they, they visit monasteries to, to make sure that, that education is happening as it should be. And it's really, really interesting just to see in their legislation even um, that they, they lay out the kinds of things um, that should be taught. And there's a major emphasis on uh, grammar um, and so on, grammar that really gives access to, to, to texts, above all the texts of the Bible, um, but also computus. And um, that's mentioned in, in the education, the, the legislation of the time. Um, computers meaning the science of the calendar. Um, so the idea that, you know, monasteries should be um, uh, not only maintaining the calendar for themselves, but also kind of be like the, the, um, the, the, the memory, the, the time memory um, for the, uh, the, the, their local region. So, you know, keeping annals and so on. Um, but, you know, because people aren't necessarily keeping an eye on the exact date and so on. Um, but monasteries, monasteries are to do that. And in order to do that, they need training in the science of the calendar. Um, so that's, that's, that's really, really interesting to see Charlemagne and his successors, how they deliberately fund schools. And it's interesting as well that they, they explicitly say this is not just divine learning. Um, there was a council at the time that mentions the, the double culture of divine and human learning. And I think that really sums up faith and reason as well that we were speaking about, the double culture of divine and human learning. Divine learning, meaning above all the scriptures and, you know, um, the, the, the faith that's passed on. Um, and then human learning, meaning the liberal arts, um, which we're, you know, borrowing from the from the ancient Roman and further back the ancient Greek world. But that these are not at all seen as in any way in opposition. It's a double culture. They go together. And the reason they justify the human learning, it's often so that, you know, if you have all these tools, you'll be able to understand scripture better, but also you'll be able to run society better. You know, these rulers, they'll need, they need secretaries, they need lawyers, and they need people who understand these, understand things in, in reasonable depth. Um, and so they're more than happy uh, to fund and patronize monastery schools and cathedral schools. That's, that's amazing because I suppose, Again, we can think of some of these rulers as just, you know, about expanding their empires or, or whatever, and not really thinking about the good of the people within the empire. And, and that's that's amazing. And like, do we know anything about the atmosphere in the classroom? Yeah, well, um, we we know a good bit um, about the sort of, um, uh, sorry, Kevin, we might just go back. Um, would you just ask um, about the Irish, because the Irish, I think this would be interesting for um, for Irish people. Just with Charlemagne, um, you might just ask, um, uh, uh, was this all kind of just happening in Europe or did it have any connection with, with the Irish monasteries? And while all this is happening on the, the continent then, what's happening in, in Ireland or is there any kind of links to Ireland with all of this? Or? Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting because, you know, with Ireland, for this period, we don't have a lot of sources about exactly what was happening in Ireland, but we do know that Ireland was famous for um, for the liberal arts, that it was famous for, above all, for the, the, the science of the calendar, be mainly because the Irish, you know, they, they came up with different results, especially for the dating of Easter at, the, at an earlier period. And so there were often rows, and um, there were rows wherever Columbanus went, for example, because he had a different dating of Easter. Um, than the locals. But it's interesting just to bear in mind, if they're having arguments about the dating of Easter, it's because they have a common understanding of reason, of science, 
um, and of how the calendar works, but they're just going to have small disagreements then about exactly um, uh, how, to, how to apply these rules. But they have a shared, a shared scientific culture there. Um, but we see, I mean, there were, there's an English writer um, called Alton who complains in the seventh century about so many English young men going to Ireland for the sake of the learning that's available there. And that would have included linguistic learning, but also um, uh, scientific learning too. Um, so there's a sense there's a brain drain happening to Ireland. And this writer, Al Talm, is, is really worried about this. But then in the ninth century, when you have Charlemagne and his successors, who are really keen to build up the educational culture in Europe, what's really fascinating is that they turn to Irish, um, uh, Irish intellectuals and English, and very often English ones who are you know, trained by, by Irish people or in, in Irish contexts. Um, so Charlemagne, and there's obviously a push factor here as well, because Ireland is under attack from Vikings at the time. And so it's not a very fun place to be a monk at the time. Um, but in Europe, there are these rulers who are saying, yeah, we'll fund you, we'll give you a library, we'll give you students. And so you have in the ninth century, literally dozens of Irish names turning up on the continent, Irish scholars, um, who are clearly far ahead of um, their equivalents on, on the continent. People like Sedulius Scotus and Clement Scotus, John Scotus, Eriugena, Martin Scotus, Martin Hibernensis in, in Lyon, and all of, these, all of these men who excel not just um, in their knowledge of the scriptures, but in the liberal arts as well, including in um, uh, what we would now call the sciences. And so there's two who come to mind. Um, Jikul and, and Dungal, and both of those um, write on, um, a, on geography. So one of them writes a tract on the eclipses. Charlemagne has a question about eclipses, and so he asks, how is it that there were two solar eclipses in one year? And this letter uh, explains how eclipses work. And another writes a work on the measurement of the sphere of the Earth, which again, it just shows how daft this idea is that Columbus you know, prove that the world was round. I mean, there in the ninth century, you have an Irish monk writing about the measurement of the sphere of the earth. Um, so these Irish scholars um, are very much a part of this renewal of education, and they're uh, they're very devoted to um, to the seven liberal arts. And I can't remember which, whether it was Dungal or, or Jikul, but one of them actually writes a poem in honor of the seven liberal arts. So that would have included, you know, poetry in honor of arithmetic, in honor of geometry, in honor of music, again, as a form of mathematics. Um, and so again, the idea that faith and reason are opposed to each other, these guys, their, their very lives and example and passion, they just show that, that they, they go together, in fact. And um, so these Irish monks are, are part of the monastery schools, they're part of the cathedral schools of the time. And the greatest example um, is the monastery of St. Gall in, in what's now the east of Switzerland. It was actually founded by an Irish monk in the seventh century, but now, you know, at this stage, it's mostly like local Germanic monks. Um, but in the uh, ninth century, um, you have these Irish monks passing through and they, they become teachers in the school and they, they form a golden generation of monks there who make immense contributions um, to, to the culture of Europe. Um, so, and again, we know, we know that they taught all seven liberal arts. So these are Irishmen who are there in Switzerland teaching astronomy, among other things. And there's one, one example of this that I think is really fascinating. And I'd like to just uh, to, to, to talk about it is, is the Reichenau, which is very near um, St. Gall. They have, um, there's a manuscript from there, from the same period. And we know it's by an Irishman. It's a, a selection of school text, text that would have been used in the classroom. We know it's by an Irishman because there's an Irish poem. If you look at the bottom left of the screen, um, you'll see this poem uh, written by, it's a famous Irish poem, many of you know it, Misha August Pangerbon. And the monk is writing about his white cat and how he's chasing the meaning of words as a scholar of the scriptures and as, as a teacher. And his, his, mouth, his, his cat is chasing mice in the very same way. And he compares himself and the cat over several verses. And so we think, oh, isn't that a beautiful kind of, you know, animal poem and so on. But actually on the other, just on the other folio, just facing it, is a, an astronomical table, um, a table showing how the moon passes through the, the different um, signs of the zodiac in the sky. Um, and so it just shows again how 
not only do they not oppose faith and reason, but also kind of literature and science just kind of went together for them as well. It was all just part of one seeking of truth and ultimately seeking God. Wow. And so if, if these great minds were leaving Ireland to, to teach in Europe, like, is there a great exodus of kind of um, intellect from Ireland kind of thing? Or, or is it more a case of there's so many great brains being churned out from these schools that, you know, there's a surplus that can go away? Or, or what's happening? You know, is like, is, is Ireland being, are we losing a lot of the great minds or are we, have we got such great things that we can actually just afford to share it? It's very hard to know just because we don't have, you know, the same sources that tell us from, tell us of that period. Um, and so it's very hard to fill in the gaps in that picture. Um, and it's probably likely because of successive Viking invasions, it's, it's likely um, that there would have been a certain decline in standards. But I wouldn't know enough about that period. And I, what I do know, I, I, I know that very little is known. And um, so I'd be slow to kind of to, to try to fill in the gaps too much there. But it is extraordinary that these men just appear on the continent, you know, and they know they're the smartest men in Europe. Uh, one of them, Sedulius Scotus, he compares the Irish to the Magi. The Magi came from the East with gifts to the Christ child. And now the Irish are coming from the West with our gifts of learning. And even uh, the, the, the local people is evidence that they were aware of this phenomenon. So Eric of, of Auxerre writing, I think in the ninth century, um, he talks about Ireland dumping boatloads of philosophers in France. Um, and philosophers there meant experts in the liberal arts, which included, therefore, these scientific subjects as well. So Ireland is just dumping boatloads of philosophers in France. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a golden age for, you know, the intellectual life um, in Ireland. Um, and I think it's worth, it's worth our, our knowing it better. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in these classrooms then where you've got, well, I, presumably you've got teachers now from all over Europe. Um, what's what, what's the, the kind of the atmosphere in the classroom at this time? Well, it's kind of that, that's something that really interests me because we might presume that, you know, a monastery classroom would be really grim, really hierarchical sort of a place. Not much fun, not much chat. Um, but any evidence that I found suggests that actually it's, it's the opposite, that there was great, great joy in learning. Um, so just one example of this is the fact that um, learning often happened through through dialogues. Um, so we have these classroom texts for, for teaching languages or for teaching astronomy. And they're, they're very often not just tracts like, you know, this is what you need to know, this is the truth and so on. But they're, they're you know, classroom discussions where the teacher asks the student questions and they go over and back and over and back. And obviously these are written down. So they're kind of model dialogues. But it suggests that there was a whole culture of teaching by means of questioning students. Um, as well as that, we know that riddles were used, probably especially for, for younger students. Um, and so there's a great collection in the, the, the library in St. Gall. Um, there's quite a few ancient manuscripts or these 8th and 9th century manuscripts that are collections of riddles. Um, and they, you know, for example, the answer to one of them will be the rainbow. And um, I'm trying to think what it says. It says something like, you know, um, I am the, the, the rains, the, the, the child of the rain and the sun or something like that. And then it goes on and you have to try and figure out what could it be. And again, there, if you're using riddles to teach, it's a way to really engage learners in what they're doing. It's not just saying, Here, here's the truth, just copy it out. You're actually trying to get them to understand um, what's, what's being taught. You also see kind of an awareness that there are different ways to learn. And so one of the great teachers of the peri period, um, Gerbert of Auriac, who ends up becoming Pope, and is actually a really interesting example of a teacher. As you mentioned, he moves from place to place. So the atmosphere, again, is international, especially for teachers. Um, but he describes how um, he was trying to teach a particular subject, found it difficult. So he stitched together a load of pieces of vellum and drew a huge diagram on, I think, something like 13 sheets of vellum. Um, and with this, he said, some of the weaker students in the class were able to learn more easily because they could see the whole thing there in front of them. And there's also evidence from Sangal. These, um, I'd love to show you some of these images now. Um, so images representing um, uh, kind of their mind maps, if you like. So there's this famous uh, panther or leopard, I'm not sure which, 
and each of his paws in this manuscript represents um, one of the uh, one of the quadrivium. And so you can see arithmetic and geometry and so on. And it's just a way for a student to remember easily um, these four subjects, the names of these four subjects. Just remember the panther, remember his paws, and then you've got it. But there's also this, this rabbit, um, very complicated diagram, and um, uh, it's represent it's uh, uh, arithmetic teaching uh, about the nature of odd and even numbers and how numbers can be combined uh, of odd and even or even and even and, and so on. Um, and so these mind maps, um, they show again an awareness that, that people sometimes learn visually um, and that just because you don't learn, um, you know, very easily in a verbal way doesn't mean you're stupid. We're going to kind of accommodate ourselves to you with these mind maps. So that shows a, quite an enlightened educational culture, as well as the fact that um, there's, there's evidence of people with fairly serious physical disabilities um, who enter monasteries and who aren't just cast to one side. They're actually just drawn into this educational culture. And um, we might have imagined that, you know, they wouldn't have been admitted, but um, uh, Notker the Stammerer was one famous uh, monk of Sangal who was taught by these Irishmen um, made huge advances in, in music and he brought his first musical compositions to his uh, to his Irish teacher to ask him what do you think and Wayne Gall the, the teacher says you know this is pretty good change this change that but the point is that he was a stammerer not for the stammerer and so he would have had difficulty expressing himself but he becomes an important um, monastic teacher um, and scholar um, as well Herman of Reichenau Reichenau is that monastery I mentioned um, uh, where the Irish monk was writing Pongerban. Um, but later on, you have this figure, Herman of Reichenau, who seems to have been very seriously disabled, whose parents weren't able to, to raise him on their own. They brought him to the monastery. Again, we might expect them just to kind of raise him in some kind of an orphanage or whatever. But no, they realized this man who had probably had spinal muscular dystrophy, which would be really serious, uh, a very debilitating um, disease. They actually taught him made him part of their monastic school. And he ends up again, making great advances um, in geography and in, in other subjects as well and becoming a significant writer. Um, so I think that shows, um, uh, to me, it's a very attractive educational culture, these monastery classrooms. Um, and uh, as well, when you read letters from students to teachers, some of them survive and they so clearly love their teachers and they love learning. And they're remembering the days of learning with great joy. And that, again, suggests to me that, that these, were, these were happy places, these monastery schools. They sound fantastic because when I'm thinking about, you know, OK, we hear liberal arts, but today the word liberal, you know, it's, it's, it's freedom from, you know, everything. But the, the difference from what I think from, from there to today is, Today, we want to be free from everything, whereas the liberal arts seemed to free your mind to think. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's free to think for yourself, to think critically, to uh, like, like that rhetoric and logic that you, can, that you can kind of make a convincing argument, but you can also make a logical argument that, you know, you can think things through and that, that frees you to be a more complete person, to to live and and to to think and 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 I suppose that then progresses the thinking and the education all around. And maybe you can share that if you're good at it and so on. Today, liberal is kind of a, a, a term where it's probably got a bit negative connotations in, in other ways because it's it's more no. I, I want to be free from everything, from all authority, from everything, and that will free me. Whereas I think I remember um, Ed Sri saying one time that um, being, being free from or free to, it, it's like a child sitting down at a piano. A child who's taught how to play the piano is free to play it, whereas a child who says, no, throw away the, you know, throw away the book, I don't need a teacher, it's like, well, they're not... They, they're free from, you know, the whole thing, but they're not free to play. And and that's, I think, so that, I think that being in an education system like that, it sounds very exciting. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I agree. Um, and I think you're kind of distinguishing sort of liberal arts from the servile arts. So the servile arts that are associated with being a slave, the liberal arts, at least in the, in the Roman world, 
associated with being a, a free man. But you're right to point out that that freedom there is kind of conceived of as a as a destination. Um, that you know these these arts this kind of there's a training which we need in order that we would be free and be able to act as as free human beings in a society of free human beings, um, and that we need a training in order in order to do that. And that just that basic training in you know thinking about the natural world around us and having kind of certain basic scientific knowledge as well as thinking about how language works, thinking about how you know arguments work and so on. Um, and it's a, it's a really, really interesting idea. And we don't often think of discipline and freedom going together. Um, but if you like, all of these people, when they were studying the liberal arts, they were doing so as discipuli, um, people who were learners. And um, so for in this world, definitely discipline and, and freedom are, are very much part of the same vision. And who could have gone to these schools at those times? Like, could, could the poor have gone... Did you have to be sponsored? Um, you know, who who was the education for? Yeah, generally, it was it was it was a mix, um, and so that legislation I mentioned from Charlemagne, um, it says you're to set up these schools not only for the poor but also for the freeborn, which is really interesting. The presumption is that these schools are going to be for um, for for the poor, um, and then uh, there are other times, you know, when it seems that in some monasteries it was mostly nobles who were being educated so you just sent your um your your if you were a nobleman you'd send your son to a monastery to be educated and so on um or your daughter you would send your daughter to a nunnery but we might talk about that in a minute um okay. but the uh, gerbert of Oriac is a brilliant example of this who ends up becoming pope he's not from a very wealthy family and yet just by dint of study he's you know welcomed into a monastery school and he he ends up becoming a famous teacher. So there's kind of this meritocratic idea there as well. Um, and there's one story from uh, a biography of Charlemagne, um, which kind of describes this this kind of this meritocratic mentality very well. Now, who knows whether it actually happened like this, but this is how it's told um, that Charlemagne, you know, in setting up one of his palace schools, um, he sets the lads to work and he, they have their teachers. I think their teachers are mentioned. It's mentioned that they're Irishman um, and then Charlemagne goes away to some battle or other and he comes back and he asks the students half of them are poor and half of them are the sons of his lords his barons or whatever and so he uh, he brings them together and he says well you know show me your work <laughs> and um, and the the, 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 the rich um, students they're not as impressive at all as the poorest students who are working very hard and making the most of, of their studies and so Charlemagne says, you know, really gives out the stink um, to uh, to the aristocrats. And um, so, again, it just shows this kind of an awareness that education is something that, you know, intelligence is something that's not necessarily linked to, to noble birth. And so the world of education is a more uh, kind of a world of equality or a different kind of hierarchy, at least. That, that sounds a little bit like the parable of the talents. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> a kind of a parallel. Yeah. <laughs> So, so could these schools were they girls could go there so obviously because you've mentioned girls and and were they were they mixed schools were they separate school what what was what was the education system for for girls? Yeah, definitely, definitely not mixed. Um, but right from the right from the beginning, um, there are monasteries of of nuns, um, and those monasteries of nuns typically um, were places where where nuns would learn to to read and write so that they could sing the psalms together. And so generally, nunneries or, or convents or monasteries of nuns are places of female literacy at a time when female literacy isn't isn't taken for granted. Um, and in some cases uh, in England, um, probably in Ireland as well, we have no evidence for this, but probably in Ireland um, and in, in Germany and in France, you have monasteries that become monasteries of nuns that become important centers of learning. So just to give you one example, I'll tell them. The guy I mentioned who was giving out about, was complaining about uh, English students going over to Ireland. And um, he writes to uh, nuns in, in Kent um, and he says to them, your community is amazing. You're like, you know, you're like a community of bees just working away, studying, thinking, um, praying, reflecting. But he talks about the kinds of study they're doing. And clearly they're studying the liberal arts just as much as, as monks would be. Um, and uh, there are other Another case of a monastery of nuns where 
one of the nuns, Frotzvita of Gandersheim, she rewrites Roman plays and she rewrites them in a hilarious way. They're already hilarious, but they're really kind of inappropriate for Christians. And also they're, they're kind of misogynistic, the way these stories are told. So she turns them on their head. She makes them more Christian and more feminist all at once um, so that women always win out in the end. And these are brilliant, really brilliant literary creations. But then find, the final example, it was just part of this world of um, you know, high standards of education in women's monasteries is Hildegard of Bingen, who is a little bit later than our period, but she's pretty incredible because um, not only does she have visions and have a kind of a whole program of reform for monastic life, but also she, uh, she, works in, she writes works in medicine and in physics, and she has a whole vision of the universe that's kind of based partly on the, the astronomy of the time. And she was taken seriously by, by male intellectuals of the time. They wrote letters to her and she wrote back and so on. Um, and so it's really interesting that at, at this period, again, this period when we often speak of it as the dark ages, that in fact for women's education, um, things were going far better then than they were, let's say at the time of the Reformation, when all of these convents were closed and women's education was set back by centuries. Yeah, it certainly sounds like we moved more into the dark ages after this than than uh, than at that time. And so we we've spoken about the the Christian world and what's going on there. Um, what's going on in the Islamic world at the time? Yeah, well, it's important to bear this in mind that you know what's happening in the Christian world is this transmission, this careful, deliberate, you know, hardworking transmission in monasteries of sort of basic scientific knowledge. Um, they're not really making any great advances. Um, they're still suffering from this lack of contact with Greek science. But in the East, in the world of Byzantium, and then in the world of uh, the Islamic empire, you have a very different situation because let's say in Baghdad, um, in the eighth and ninth centuries, you have this whole translation movement. And so the rulers of the Islamic world, they're aware of all this Greek science and together with, with Christian, their Christian subjects and their Muslim subjects, they translate huge amounts of Greek philosophy and science into Arabic. And then you have a kind of a flourishing of Islamic science and um, because they have access to all of these ideas, access to all of this information, these methods above all the kind of the Aristotelian method for thinking about the natural world. And they apply all of these methods and they make genuine advances in astronomy and medicine and so on. Um, and so in a sense, what's stalled in the West, you know, they're doing their best um, and they're, they're, they're continuing to keep all of this alive, but really they're flying ahead um, in, the, in the Islamic world. Um, and these two worlds are going to come into contact again in the uh, 12th century, especially. And that's then going to give huge impetus to learning again in the West. Um, so we'll see next time, we'll see how universities are born. But this is kind of what we've looked at today, sort of the prehistory of universities, all of these monastery and cathedral schools and palace schools that are operating over centuries um, and just keeping the intellectual life of Europe uh, ticking over, sometimes with brief uh, flashes of genius, um, but certainly keeping the, the project of truth seeking and truth seeking about the natural world, as well as seeking the truth um, about divine things, keeping that project going. You know, it's it's amazing. I remember seeing a little cartoon one time and there was a picture of a man just in the middle of a, of a road. And it just asked, um, which direction is the man going in? And he's, he's facing a ditch. It's like, which direction is the man going in? And um, anyway, the whole thing, it, it was all a kind of a plan. A play on, on the idea that we can't know where someone is going until we know where they've come from. So it, it's just been it's been fantastic today to, to find out that little that gap really in, in that what we called the dark ages. I won't be referring to them as them anymore, not from an education point of view anyway. And and like that, it's I think you've given a great lead in there to where uh, the Christian world and the Islamic world will will collide in in, in the universities, and and we can see this great spark in um, in education. And that is our next episode is um, is the university. So that that we've covered that time period, and uh, that's that's been fantastic. Thanks so much, Father Connor. Thanks for all your input.
Um, you certainly told me 100% of the information uh, today I did not know before this. So thanks so much. Some, some of it is fairly obscure. And, um, but I think especially as, as Irish people, um, it's something, you know, we're, we're vaguely aware of the island of saints and scholars, but to get a, a more precise understanding of it, and sometimes we'll have this idea how the Irish saved civilization. But, you know, we see here that really it's the Irish working in collaboration with all kinds of other people, um, uh, that that was really what kind of saved civilization in the West. Um, and, and I think, you know, it, it, it's really a whole period that we should delight in learning more about. Um, just slightly later than our period, but I think it's worth recommending a new book. Um, and I have to recommend it because I've been in contact with the author and he actually is the one who identified that astronomical table as the moon moving through the different phases of the sky. Seb Falk, F-A-L-K is his name, and it's called The Light Ages, and it's a play on that idea of the Dark Ages. And he's, he, he, he's showing how um, in a Benedictine monastery in England, um, how there were great advances made uh, in astronomical instruments, these incredible instruments that were developed. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's really worth having a look at that book and, and maybe getting a hold of it as well. It's one of a range of books that is just showing how interesting medieval science was, not exaggerating the case as if to make out, you know, that they were all Einstein before Einstein, um, but just to show that um, they're, they're in continuity with us so much more um, than we're used to, to thinking. What, what's the name of that again? The Light Ages. The Light Ages by mm -hmm. Seb Falk. Well worth a read. That's great. No, thanks because um, because I think, like you mentioned there, you know that not making them out to be Einstein before Einstein existed, but sometimes we can make it out that Einstein, you know, just dropped down here and was the first brain in the planet. You know, it's um, so it's it's great to see like that. Just all of these giants that that whose shoulders these guys are standing on. So that's, it's, it's great. It's funny, you're, you're reminding me of, um, you know, Albert the Great. We did an episode on him. And, and if you haven't watched it, you know, check it out because he's a fascinating figure. Um, but I just did a bit of work on him recently. I gave another talk on him. I'm just falling in love with Albert. He's just an amazing, amazing guy. And I just said, I'm going to have a look at the people who are usually recognized as the founders of modern geology, zoology, physics, and so on. And so I looked at about six or seven, you know, people like Agricola in, in geology, Gessner in, in zoology, um, uh, uh, Isaac Newton, Galileo, and, and people like that, William Harvey in uh, anatomy. And I just said, I'm going to look at their works and see if they're citing Albert the Great. And in every single case, sometimes, you know, to great effect, um, Albert the Great is a figure that they're referring to. And so we, we think of the Middle Ages as, you know, something that, that these guys knew nothing about, as if they just invented science just, you know, out of nothing. And in fact, yeah. when you look at their works, they're engaging with all these generations that went before them as, you know, recognizing uh, the giants on whose shoulders they're standing. That's, that's amazing. And actually, you told us when the feast day of Albert the Great is. When is the that? 15th, the 15th of November. I was thinking that I was uh, I I was thinking it was sometime around then, but I wasn't going out on a limb to say it. I was like I was thinking it was somewhere. Like that. So yeah, Father Connor, thanks so much. It's been wonderful having you again, and uh, we look forward to the next one on universities. Pleasure. Looking forward to. It. Thanks very much, Kevin, for all your work. You're very welcome. God bless, Father. <laughs>